Here at the Vancouver Public Library since February 12th, when an opinion article about this evening's event appeared in the Vancouver Sun, we have experienced just how difficult this can be. As we know, there are community members, and particularly those in the Jewish community, who are angry, hurt, and offended that this event is taking place, and they have called for its cancellation. We very much regret that this is the case. However, it remains the Library's belief that we must stand by the principle of freedom of expression, and therefore, the decision was made not to cancel the program. The selection of materials collected and presented at Vancouver Public Library is based on the belief that every person has the right to access all expressions of knowledge, opinion, and creativity, and express their thoughts publicly within the limits set by law. This freedom of access is essential to the health and development of a democratic society. However, freedom of choice within the library cannot be limited by the personal views of any group or individual, even the majority. Uh, Upholding the principle of intellectual freedom can also, at times, put you in the position of appearing to support points of view in which you do not believe. The role of the public library, however, is to provide a forum for an open and public exchange of contradictory views and to make available materials that represent a wide range of views. This is especially true during Freedom to Read Week. Uh, when libraries often present books that people might feel uncomfortable reading. Greg Felton's new book, The Host and the Parasite, is such a book. Greg Felton currently writes for print and online publications about Middle Eastern and Canadian politics. He has a bachelor's degree in Russian studies and a master's degree in political science from the University of British Columbia. With that, I will now introduce Greg Felton. Um, what I'd like to start off by, ask, by suggesting is that those of you who have, have looked at the uh, United States over the last eight years can only look with sadness and despair at what has happened to what used to be a republic. For 225 years, the United States has been at least nominally supportive of things like individual rights, protection of the person, the rights against the accused, habeas corpus, the right against illegal search and seizure. And now, as we look around, we have the United States becoming the apotheosis, the very opposite of what it started out to be. Torture is now officially justified as national policy. The United States has declared war on its own citizens. People can be arrested without warrant. Wiretaps are allowed without judicial permission. Uh, the economy has been spent into an absurd debt of $9 trillion much of it earned during the time of George W. Bush. And over this time, we are supposed to think of the United States as a republic, as the same country that you and I grew up with. When I was a boy in the 1960s, I used to watch television like all of you, those of you who are older, as much as old as I am. And I'd watch shows like cartoons like Superman, although Canadian invented it, or Mighty Mouse or Bugs Bunny, and I used to have a great affection for the United States. To me, it was simply a country that espoused the, the motto of peace, justice, and the American way, truth, justice, and the American way. Well, that no longer applies. And I don't think anybody in this room would agree, would argue that the United States is fundamentally different than what it was during the 1950s and 60s or even the 1970s. And because of that, I think I'd like to explain why this change took place. Because if I were to poll the audience, I bet I would find Almost all of you, or most of you at least, would say the United States went downhill when George W. Bush occupied the White House. Until Bill Clinton was, while well, Bill Clinton was president, we had a pretty good time. Uh, September the 11th knocked down a couple of buildings, led to the uh, passage of the USA Patriot Act. And from there, people might argue, we went into a spiral into the abyss of statism, torture, imperial overreach, and all other sorts of things you can associate with undemocratic activity. Well, if you do that, you end up with a problem. And the problem is this. On October 3rd, 2001, 24 days after September the 11th happened, the Department of Justice handed Congress a document. The Department of Justice handed Congress a document. It was called the USA Patriot Act, and Congress was told to pass it. 
Now, Congress is a legislative body. It's the body that makes laws. But here we have a Congress being told to follow a diktat from the executive, which is kind of weird. At least Congress should have the right to have oversight. Congress should at least evaluate it, discuss it, debate it. Well, Senator Russell Feingold of Wisconsin, Democratic senator, was one such person who did read it and insisted on some amendments being made before he would introduce it for discussion. The Patriot Act was passed, was entered into the House October 23rd and signed by Bush on October 26th. Now for legislation, that is an absurdly fast scenario. But that document did something very strange and very sad because it legislated the Republic out of existence. That document killed the Republic and turned the United States into a proto-fascist empire, legally. But if we start from this perspective and think the United States went downhill from this state, we end up with a problem. We have to explain why a Congress would commit political suicide. Why would Congress do this? Well, if you have Congress comprised of Republicans and Democrats who are Democratic, it doesn't make any sense. You don't just commit suicide like that. Well, my book takes a perspective that Congress was incapable of defending the Constitution, which, of course, the Patriot Act utterly destroys. It is my view that the United States went downhill not beginning with George W. Bush, but beginning with Ronald Reagan in 1980. And through a period of 25 years, the United States managed to mutate from a republic slowly toward a police state. And it did so because of events that came out of the Vietnam War. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back a bit to the climate of the 1960s and describe for you what happened during the, because of the counterculture and the anti-war movement. In the 1960s, I'm sure you will, many of you know, the United States was fighting two battles at once, Vietnam and Lyndon Johnson's Great Society public spending programs. Johnson was a populist. He was a reformer. He believed in spending money to help Americans, the poor Americans, all Americans. The problem is it was an expensive proposition, and it ran counter to a lot of people's belief that the state ought to have no role in spending money on people that people ought to be responsible for themselves. And a lot of conservatives, so-called Straussians or neoconservatives, took exception to this. And as a result of the anti-war movement, the great, the, uh, great society spending, the rise of civil rights and sexual liberation and equality for women, the, there developed in the United States a reactionary anti-democratic countercurrent comprised of three distinct elements. One was evangelical Christians, who saw this as a dangerous threat to the stability of the United States and took exception to the spending programs and the liberalization, liberalized sexual attitudes. The, sum, the seminal point for this was the 1973 passage of the Roe versus Wade decision, which made abortion legal upon demand, or at least decriminalized it. In that same year, Paul Weyrich founded something called the Heritage Foundation, the very first so-called conservative think tank. And ultimately, 11 members of Heritage would find their way into Ronald Reagan's first government. So to all intents and purposes, Ronald Reagan was a front man for the Heritage Foundation. The second group were the so-called neocons, properly called Straussians, because they followed the teachings of a professor called Leo Strauss. And he got a big R leg up from a man named Irving Kristol, a, a very influential um, a Jewish professor who would, left New York, went to Washington, D.C., and helped turn Leo Strauss's philosophy of unenlightened self-interest into a major economic movement. Leo Strauss believed that a government had a right to lie to its own people, to keep truths from them, not to give people, the common people, any sort of help because that would weaken the fiber of American society. And America had to be strong to face up to the threats of the communists and the fascists and all this sort of stuff. The third group were called Jewish Zionists. Norman Putt Horitz, Irving Kristol, Charles Krauthammer, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, a whole list of individuals whom George H.W. Bush would collectively call the crazies. <laughs> 
these people together formed what I call <clears throat> the fascist troika, the fascist undercurrent that had been extant in the United States culture for some time, but had not risen to any sort of political prominence because, for the most part, radical religion, although practiced in the United States, was not really welcome at the highest levels. The separation of church and state was still at least nominally respected. And because of this, it was very difficult to profess open support for evangelical Christianity. And for Jews, it was difficult also, because until the 1967 war, Jewish Americans were very concerned that they might be considered somewhat less than true Americans if they harbored a dual allegiance to Israel. So for the 19, up until 1967, the Holocaust and other sorts of Zionist issues were kept very much out of the public view. They were very personal. They were not to be discussed. In fact, only three books on the subject existed until 1967. And then 1967 happened. Israel provoked a war in the Middle East and managed to seize control of the Suez. It occupied East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, Suez, the West Bank, Gaza Strip. It is still an illegal occupation of much of that territory today. But the fact that Israel did it meant that Israel was no longer some afterthought in US policy, which was oil-based, strictly speaking. The U.S. wanted the Middle East for oil. That's all we cared about. But Israel now was a major player. Because Israel, is, American Jews could now look upon Israel with pride because they conquered territory. They could now espouse both support for Israel and the United States. And so did Lyndon Johnson. And principally because Israel is one of the few countries that wouldn't give them grief over Vietnam. So by the time 1973 comes around, we have three groups of people. Evangelical Christians, Jewish Zionists, and Straussian neoconservatives, neither one of which has any regard for America. What happened then, during this period, which was a reaction against the populism of the 60s, came to a particular, particularly interesting end in 1976 with Jimmy Carter's victory over Gerald Ford, just by a squeaker. It was the narrowest victory since 1912. And that decision, defeating Gerald Ford, was, I believe, a decision by the United States public to turn its back on the Vietnam War, the cruelty, the sadism, the lies, the corruption, the violence perpetrated in the name of a misbegotten war, and turn their minds forward to look for something else. America wanted a new country, and Ford was a remnant of the old country, though a very good man. Carter was an evangelical Christian, a Baptist. He made it possible for Christians to come out from the closet, so to speak, and profess both a political and a religious identity. What Carter failed to understand, though, is that with respect to the Middle East, he was not there to represent the United States. He was there to represent, well, Israel. Because soon after he was elected, now I'm talking about 1977 March in Clinton, Massachusetts. He delivered a speech where he spoke honestly, intelligently, I think, about the need for a Palestinian homeland. Well, the Israel lobby basically had a collective heart attack. They assailed him. They slandered him. They libeled him. They attacked him vigorously. And Carter tried to backpedal out of this, saying, well, it's going to be a condominium with Jordan and all this stuff. But it was too late. The Israel lobby, which came to prominence under Harry Truman in 1948 and owed its allegiance to the, to the Democratic Party, was for the first time considering supporting an, a Republican candidate for president, Ronald Reagan. Reagan himself came to power with really nothing upstairs except a good moral sense and an awestruck attitude. He had little understanding of economics, no understanding of foreign policy and basically made a devil's pact with Jack Kemp and certain what are called neocon supply-side economists that, yes, I'll implement your, your economic policy if you put me in office, if you support me. And so what happened with the election of 1980 was that the Zionists, both Christian and Jewish, and the neocons, 
came to power and their front man was Ronald Reagan. And to the 1980s, we have a transition period. A transition period between the, and the period between the role of oil as the dominant influence and cause of US policy in the Middle East and that of supporting Israel to the detriment of oil and to the detriment of the United States. Some of the most interesting things happened soon after Reagan took office. And this happened both in Libya, excuse me, Lebanon, Iraq, and Palestine. Menachem Begin was head of, the, uh, of Israel at the time, the first Likudnik head of Israel. And Reagan decided that he was going to assert himself as an American foreign policy expert. You know, I want certain things done. In June 1981, Israel bombed the Ozerik nuclear power plant in Iraq. It did so illegally, using American weaponry, contrary to the U.S. Procurement Act, using U.S. satellite technology, contrary to U.S. law, and the United States did nothing about it. In, 19, in uh, September 1982, Reagan spoke of a Palestinian peace. And he, like every other um, president since Johnson, spoke against continued Israeli construction of illegal settlements. Four days after Reagan made his speech, Begin humiliated Reagan, excuse me, Begin humiliated Reagan, that's right, and promised $18.5 billion for new settlements. On the September the 6th, 1982, Lebanon was, in, was under invasion by Israel. And Reagan saw pictures of bombed out cities and children burnt beyond recognition. And Reagan, for all of his faults, was a very moral man. He had a sense of humanity. And he told Reagan he had enough of this. He wanted to stop doing it. And all that Reagan could do was throw up the Holocaust in his face and, and told Reagan to pound salt. Throughout the 1980s, Israel virtually ignored everything the United States wanted to do in the Middle East. It had carte blanche to do what it wanted. And from the 1980s onward, we see a progressive diminution of oil as the main interest of the US. Now, I want to say this because up until from 1932, say, until about 1979, US oil policy was pretty predictable. You put a tyrant in charge. You tell him to repress the democratic rights of his people because, you know, democratic societies provide for their people and that cost, you know, is factored into the cost of extracting the oil from the ground. America doesn't like paying much for its oil. It likes to get it real cheap. And so in case of Saudi Arabia and Iran under the Shah, which the U.S. installed over the wishes of the Iranian people, the U.S. had a very nicely contained supply of oil. Repressive regimes, cheap oil, loyal, everything's okay. Well, if you look at that particular oil policy, and we look at how Reagan and George W. Bush behaved, we see an, an, inco an incommensurability. For example, Reagan wanted to ensure a safe political climate for the oil in the Persian Gulf, with Saddam Hussein as head of Iraq. He sent Donald Rumsfeld to Iraq to shake Saddam Hussein's hand and assure him of U.S. support for a pipeline to be built to the support city of Aqaba. Of course, it was well known that Saddam Hussein at the time was using uh, chemical and biological weapons in its war against Iran. It was well known. The Americans knew it. The Americans said nothing. Americans wanted oil, they wanted stability, they wanted a quiet economic climate. Flash forward to 2000 something or other. George W. Bush fabricates an implausible, untenable, farcical case against Saddam Hussein for having weapons of mass destruction in order to bomb the bejesus out of his country. Now in 1991, Dick Cheney had acknowledged that there was never, there was no more threat of nuclear weapons, excuse me, weapons of mass destruction from Saddam Hussein. 
Colin Powell said the same thing in 2000. So did Condoleezza Rice the next year. In fact, Cheney, twice in 10 years, Powell twice, Rice once, within the last seven years, had admitted that Saddam Hussein had no useful weapons of mass destruction and posed no threat to the US or Israel. Within months of the last of those announcements, the US policy flip-flopped 180 degrees. All of a sudden, weapons of mass destruction, which were dismissed as nonsense, which were openly, openly acknowledged to be non-existent, were now asserted to be facts. Why would the US do this? Why would, what, what caused the United States to have a, such a complete change of understanding? Because no new information had come forward to change the previous assessments, which were correct and have been shown to be correct. Well, the only interested party, the only country interested in bombing Iraq was Israel for two reasons. Well, three reasons, actually. Iran, Iraq has a lot of oil. Israel needs oil. Iraq has a lot of water. The Tigris and the Euphrates are within the ambit of what is called the maximalist Zionist claim on Middle Eastern land from the Nile to the Euphrates. It's also the case that Saddam Hussein was one of the few Arab leaders courageous enough to stand up and defend the Palestinians against the repression and the sadism of the Israeli state. The occupation is to this day illegal, but it's hard to find any outlet in the media willing to say this. So Saddam Hussein was a political problem and also the head of a country that was the capital of the Arab world, culturally speaking. Baghdad was a great center of learning and Hussein had a good army. But armies in the, United, in the Middle East are not something Israel wants on its doorstep. Israel wants to have complete military superiority over the region. And so we had a provocation to bomb Iraq. It wasn't just Bush, though. Throughout the 1990s, Iraq was starved under more illegal no-fly zones and sanctions regimes, which did nothing but starve Iraqi children and other people. Iraq has never posed a threat to anyone, militarily speaking. The Saudis were scared because they didn't like the idea of an Arab secular Arab regime having weapons on its border, but that's their problem. It was not justified to starve a nation just because some countries were uncomfortable with Hussein. I mean, Hussein was an American ally to all intents and purposes. He attacked Iran after being goaded by the U.S. The Iran-Iraq war started because the U.S. pushed Hussein to attack Iran around the Shat al-Arab waterway in the south. And then Saddam Hussein took the American bait and invaded Kuwait. An excuse for George W. Bush, H.W. Bush, to put military into Saudi Arabia to secure oil. Now, if you want to ask why on earth the U.S. would attack Iraq, you've got me, because Iraq posed no threat to the United States. It was not in the United States' interest to bomb Iraq. Why else do it? Again, we have to understand that the United States government, especially since, especially since Clinton, has been populated by people who owe more of an allegiance to Israel than to the United States itself. To this day, there are people in the American government who are citizens of Israel. And to have a dual citizen form the policy really brings up questions of duplicity, treason, the very sort of concerns that Jews had before 1967. But these don't matter anymore. It is impossible to believe that a republic could commit suicide by passing the Patriot Act. But it makes more sense to believe that Israel, the United States Congress, is not in control of itself. The people making policy would rather serve Israel than serve their own public. I mean, why else would we, with George W. Bush, veto a bill for $30 billion for child insurance yet, write a blank check to bomb Arabs into oblivion? Why terrorize and torture people for no good purpose? I mean, if you want Iraq to supply oil, you don't make the climate so untenable 
that oil becomes impossible to export. There is direct contradiction between traditional oil policy as practiced up until, until uh, the mid-80s and oil policy under Bush. And it's important to realize that if we're going to have a discussion about what happened on September the 11th and other such things, we have to look at who benefited from it. The Patriot Act, in my view, represents the culminating act of the fascist coup d'etat that happened in 1980. Now, it was a coup d'etat that happened with the willingness and support of the American public. Because, after all, if the liberal Eastern establishment could bring the country to such disgrace in Vietnam, then perhaps it's time we put our faith in people who didn't really think for a living. Put our faith in people who thought of religion, people who told us what we wanted to hear, people who were less intellectual than they were jingoistic and rah-rah, energetic Americans. Ronald Reagan had no business being president, but he spoke to the need of Americans to feel good about themselves. Because both the Republicans and Democrats had been so irredeemably tainted by the war. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution tainted the Johnson administration. The secret bombing of Cambodia and the Watergate cover-up destroyed the Republican credibility. And so they put their faith in people who told them what they wanted to hear and essentially consigned the country to people who did not know what they were doing and had objectives other than that that served the interests of the American people. I mean, to this day, the United States is something called the Strategic Oil Reserve Agreement with Israel, under which it will guarantee to supply Israel with oil in the event of a crisis, even to the extent of denying oil to its own people. The United States has been humiliated, abused, disgraced, internationally and domestically, as it moves to support Israel in whatever it does. And it is impossible to think that this is being done willingly, that the United States is the same country that existed in the 1960s and 70s. The only possible thing that we can conclude is that the United States has been under Israeli occupation to all intents and purposes. I think that's hilarious. Well, okay. Well, well, I'll be finished in a minute. The only way to understand the last eight years is that it's a culmination of a number of things that happened in the United States that I articulate in my book here and shows how the United States slowly and quite clearly allowed itself to be occupied and humiliated by a lobby that had at its primary interest the interests of another government. Because a lot of people will argue that, well, the United States is the strongest country in the world. Nobody could push the United States around. Well, if you look at the people who run the United States, the military industrial complex is a very good example. The interplay between them and the Israel lobby is very, very close. And it makes no sense for the United States to murder Arabs en masse. It makes no sense for the United States to repudiate its own principles and declare war on its own citizens. The only way we can make sense of this is that the people in Washington are serving another government, that we have essentially a treasonous government. And in fact, if you know how both Bush stole the last two elections, it's not legitimately elected. We have to look at the sort of gangsterism that we most, most commonly associate with the mafia or some other sort of organized crime. There is no other way to explain the United States from a rational point of view. It cannot be done. There is no rational explanation for the United States' behavior. We must assume an irrational frame of reference. We must assume that the United States we see and the United States that really exists are quite two separate things. And if we do that, and we look at the events of September the 11th and how that happened, and the people who were responsible for it, we end up with conclusions that the United States has been dominated by interest groups that put the interests of America behind that of Israel.
I have a number of other things I could say, but I don't want to speak for too much longer, and I will give the floor over to questions.